I labeled this as proper dependency management, but often referred to as dependency hell. Um, kind of the same format as the last one. Again, I wanted to, you know, have this middle section of our discussion focused on just kind of advice and, and uh, you know, and, and tips and tricks. Um, but obviously it can get pretty messy with dependencies. Uh, so I wanted to, again, ask the three of you just some tips and tricks that you've learned uh, over the years of, uh, of, of managing it um, so it's a little less stressful. As I work more as a data engineer in the, in the data side, like machine learning and stuff, so I don't have too much problem with dependencies. Yeah. But uh, a nice framework that I learned uh, in the past few months, it's called the Poetry. And uh, in that, it's like, <laughs> a, you have NPM and Yarn for uh, JavaScript, right? So Poetry yeah. solves basically the same problem. So what is the solution to fix this, to make it right and not bad? Then we can like, uh, we have this file that we have all your libraries and dependencies in there and you can uh, like uh, manage all your local environment and when you are developing and uh, when your uh, application is ready to go to production you can uh, take a look on your dependency uh, file in there and say yeah that's good so move it away so it's a, a nice tool that i i learned in the past few months well, yeah, speaking about dependencies, um, I saw many times projects without pinning dependencies into the requirements of the projects. Um, <laughs> it's good in a way, yeah. in a way, let's say in a way, because once you upgrade, I mean, you kind of ensure to always keep up to date the, the, the dependencies of your project, but it could end up in, you know, incompatibility because of the latest release of something yep. is not anymore compatible with something else it was already there so yeah i would encourage to always pin versions of dependencies in the project in order to uh, gain control about what a specific version of a dependencies provides to a project or how it interacts with other dependencies i want to I want to bring discussion. I want fire. I'm going to burn the shit out of you. So do you guys, uh, Antonio and Mirko, do you guys think that requirement.txt is still relevant today? I think so. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, if you have any other better alternative, I'm open to that. Better than nothing, right? It's what it is. <laughs> yeah, no, so I I am Python requirement TXT. It's the de facto standard, but I don't like it very much because of two things. Uh, first, you can uh, give a dependency without a version, as Mirko said, and it doesn't keep track of dependencies of dependencies. And there, where is come dependency hell. Maybe one library depends on a library and try, you try to put another library into the project that depends on the, on the first library that the first one, but with different versions and then things break and you don't have a clue why. And that's why I like poetry because not only it gets the version of the library that you're installing right now, but also keeps track of the dependencies of the dependencies. Fuck yeah! And I believe mm. poetry is a good tool because not only it kept uh, the standard of the community with PEP 5, 8, something, I, I forgot, about the PI project, that Tomo, you know? I, I mm -hmm. forgot which number of the PEP was this. But not only this, but uh, it was well received by the community. Uh, different than pip -env. Even though a lot of people still use pip -env, it's not that common. And it, was it pip -env that you uh, that created that requirements.ini, which in turn builds the requirement txt with the dependencies, but you wouldn't be able to mess with the requirements txt? I, I forgot. Do you remember those? I don't know. You tell me. I heard about that. But you were right when it comes to inner dependencies. You are definitely right. Sometimes it's very hard to investigate and troubleshoot what's not going well there. And yeah, that keeps an eye. I mean, that requires a very uh, detailed investigation. Yeah. yeah. You're so right. I would argue, 
requirements txt we all love you you've been part of python history but now poetry rules if you're starting a new project please poetry yeah definitely to be honest i heard but I'd never use it i used it's nice it's nice for environment uh, handling um, for quick thing, quicker things, I do prefer virtual env, honestly. But I mean, it's another good option, Anaconda. Uh, I worked a little bit with Anaconda since I began in the data science and analytics kind of area. And Anaconda, for those who doesn't know, it's a, like a Python. <laughs> worse every second. I hate snakes. Uh, distribution with other things with it. So Anaconda actually uh, uh, is Python with already a lot of data science dependency tools like uh, NumPy, like Pandas, like Seaborn and other stuff. Good stuff, people. Good stuff. So for a beginning, beginning data scientist that's going to need to create a lot of things in any a full environment and wants to start right away maybe maybe it's good i don't like anaconda i like miniconda it's like anaconda but without all of that those dependencies installed it's smaller but it's harder because Anaconda can be very big and you're going to install a lot of dependencies packages that you might not even use if you're going to start from the zero, I would recommend starting to create stuff in Python in Colab, Google Colab or something or some other platform like that, where you don't need to install Python or packages directly at your machine. And once you get familiar with how to manage those environments, then you install your local machine. And I wouldn't recommend installing Python directly. I would recommend installing Python with PyEnv. So, Anaconda, yeah. Miniconda, yeah. better. You don't want to mess up with the system Python, right? Especially in Linux distributions. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> and you're going to need it. <laughs> this is interesting to me, though. So, but but like Anaconda and even Conda things like that, they are they they do come with something like a modified version of Python. It's almost like its own like a, like a Linux distro would be like it's a, kind of a tweaked version. Something like that. Something okay, like that. Okay, cool. So cool. Anaconda and Miniconda come with Python. Yep. Uh, Conda uh, comes with both of them, and it's the dependency management. Got and it. they in Kanda, it's able to install not only Python packages, but also system lab libraries. I understand nothing. Got That's it, got it. it. Which then I and imagine cool. that, which kind of uh, relates to our next thing, but I, I imagine that new versions of Python will come out and the Anaconda uh, version will kind of be on a older version of Python. Is that true? Or can you upgrade Python along with Anaconda? No, you. Yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> one or the other. For instance, yep. the re even though requirements txt kind of work with Conda, it's not yeah. very good. You need to create an environment.yaml to manage the environment with Conda. And okay. usually, when you are building a project, you're gonna either choose one or the other. To try to use, I try to use both because. A project that I was building had some system dependencies and I liked Conda to use that, but I already loved poetry and tried to yep. use both and that didn't went well. So Yeah, <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Anyone watching at home, that's it's, it's good advice. That's uh, life learning. <laughs>